About 50,000 residents of the northern Gaza Strip responded to the IDF's repeated calls to move southward out of harm's way and away from the fighting in and around Gaza City. There is no ceasefire. We are battling Hamas. There is no ceasefire. Gazan civilians are fleeing from the north to the south because they understand Hamas is using them as a human shield. The IDF announced it's made significant progress on the ground and has now destroyed more than 130 terror tunnels. It also released this intercepted conversation between two Hamas terrorists saying they can use ambulances anytime they want to move around. On Israel's northern border, the war inside Syria is expanding with both the U.S. and Israel launching airstrikes against Iranian-backed targets. The U.S. carried out a strike on a weapons warehouse used by militias backed by Iran. The strikes came after a growing number of attacks on bases with U.S. troops. Back in Israel, the watchdog group Honest Reporting released this expose that shows Gaza-based freelance journalists who work for publications like AP, The New York Times, CNN and Reuters, documented the October 7th massacre. Gil Huffman of Honest Reporting says this raises ethical questions. What were they doing in our country? You know, journalists just can't go into our country without permission. That's something that the terrorists do. They infiltrated together with terrorists. That alone was aiding and abetting what the terrorists were doing. Here you're talking about people who took pictures with selfies with tanks as, as people were being murdered. This video of Hassan Islaya, a freelancer for CNN and AP, shows him in front of an Israeli tank the morning of the attack. And this photo shows him pictured with Yahya Sinwar, the mastermind of the October 7th massacre. AP says it had no knowledge of the October 7th attacks before they happened. Hamas leaders also revealed their plans for what they call a permanent state of war with Israel, telling the New York Times they hope the Arab world would stand with them, saying only violence could revive the cause of the Palestinian people. Benny Gantz, a member of Israel's war cabinet, says the war with Hamas deals with Israel's very existence and that there is no time limit on how long it will last. As international pressure grows on Israel for a ceasefire, former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson came to Israel to show his support when he met with some IDF soldiers from the UK. Well, what I see is the very clear distinction uh, between people like the, the soldiers in this room who try as far as they can and who are trained uh, to minimize civilian, civilian casualties and, and suffering and people who set out to commit atrocities against civilians, who chase civilians around their living rooms, uh, who, who follow them into, into bunkers uh, to murder them. Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem with more. So, Chris, Boris Johnson made clear his support for Israel, but international pressure is growing for a pause in the fighting to gain the release of more hostages. Could Israel go along? Well, first of all, uh, Ephraim, let me uh, add that Scott Morrison, he's the former prime minister of Australia. He joined Boris Johnson. He added his endorsement to what he felt Israel is doing. He felt there was no moral equivalence between Israel and Hamas. And to your question, I think Israel can do small pauses in the fighting for a few hours like they did yesterday to let Gazans escape. But a, but a three-day pause that's been proposed by people like U.S. President Joe Biden is likely off the table for Israel. Uh, they felt it would stop the military momentum of the IDF. Uh, also, it would give Hamas an opportunity to rearm and regroup and, uh, and, and put uh, IDF soldiers at risk. And three, uh, you know, it would put more pressure on Israel to keep that ceasefire going and likely lose international support if they resume military action. Israel is evacuating civilians despite world pressure on them to obey the laws of war. Doesn't Israel feel like they are obeying those laws while Hamas uses civilians as shields? They do, and they feel like there's a double standard while, you know, they fight this war in two battlefields. One, the military battlefield, where they feel like they're obeying international law. Uh, you hear that from soldiers as well, that exactly what they're trained before they get to the battlefield. Two, the battle is, uh, is also in, uh, for world public opinion. And the challenge for Israel is that it's hard to fight the images coming out of the Gaza Strip with destroyed buildings and dead and wounded Palestinians, some of, you, some of whom did not heed the pleas 
of the IDF to get out of harm's way. And remember, the IDF, uh, Ephraim, has dropped over a million leaflets telling Palestinians to get out of harm's way. They've sent about six million text messages and about four million phone calls. And they're, what they're doing is they tell, tell people get out and get buildings before they're destroyed to get out of harm's way and then where to go. Uh, so this is unprecedented in uh, modern warfare, but that's what Israel is doing to, uh, to prevent civilian casualties. Hamas is talking about a permanent state of war, and Israel's defense minister says there is no time limit on how long the war with Hamas will last. Is Israel really digging in for a long conflict even uh, after the current war ends? Uh, they are, Ephraim, and I'll tell you why. They realize perhaps more than now that this is really a war without end. And the battle uh, Israel is facing and the West is facing right now goes beyond the current conflict. For groups like Hamas, it's never over. Uh, for Hamas, it's all the Islamic concept of the house of peace and the house of war. The house of peace uh, in the Islamic mindset is the world that's under the control of Islam. The house of war is the world not under the control of Islam. And so the house of peace is at a, an internal war with the house of war to put it under the control of Islam. So the war is never over. And the war is not only with Israel, uh, and that's what we've been hearing over and over again. It's with the United States and all free countries. Uh, that's why a brother of a hostage uh, in Congress said yesterday that we're, we're next, meaning the United States, and ask people to wake up. And why many intercessors right now are saying uh, it's a time of urgent 911 prayer uh, for the United States, for protection, uh, and for people in Europe as well. Anywhere that where, where Islam is trying to take over, and many times in Europe right now it's, it's an urgent thing because uh, many Muslims have come in, millions have come into European countries, putting them at risk as well. I want to turn to uh, what news organizations are saying, f saying about the freelance photographer who worked with them, who was photographed with the mastermind uh, on October 7th for the, mass uh, the massacre. Well, CNN says he suspended that reporter and that, that journalist, and AP says it really had no uh, foreknowledge of the October uh, 7th attacks. And I would add, uh, Ephraim, you know, that the government here in uh, Israel is saying, uh, saying these journalists were accomplices and actually crimes against humanity, contrary to professional ethics. It's also sent an urgent letter to the bureau chiefs of all these media organizations that employed this journalist and, uh, and demanded uh, immediate action. But I would say, you know, for many of these organizations in honest reporting, we interviewed Gil Hoffman, the uh, director here in Jerusalem, about that. And uh, he's just uh, really saying this is something that, uh, that, that these organizations should be aware of. They were, produ they were publishing photographs by the AP that very day or day after about actually what was happening on the ground there. And it's a very, very serious allegation. Indeed it is. Our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joining us from Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Continue to stay safe, and we are certainly continuing to pray for you.